Thanks for connecting to this virtual poster presentation and discussion with a recent AMCP Foundation Best Poster Awardee. I'm pleased to be joined today by I Quinn Nguyen as she presents her information and data on uh, what won her the Best Poster Competition for her category. The AMCP Foundation Best Poster Competition is hosted at AMCP meetings, and we want to thank CVS Health for their generous support of the competition. As we get into uh, the presentation today, I'll be your moderator. Uh, my name is Jeff Heater, and I am the AMCP and AMCP Foundo Foundation Joint uh, um, Research Committee uh, member, um, and happy to be with you today as we walk through the uh, presentation. So first, as we get started, I wanted to take a moment and talk a little bit about uh, the JRC or Joint Research Committee and really focus on their objective and initiatives. Uh, really, the committee objective is really focused on uh, creating and disseminating uh, relevant research as it relates to initiatives that advance patient care services uh, within managed care pharmacy with the ultimate objective of improving health care for all. Uh, and we do this through three main initiatives. The first one, uh, developing and then uh, timely updates to a research agenda, uh, which obviously identifies and prioritizes the evidentiary gaps uh, that are found within managed care pharmacy. The second one is then to disseminate that research agenda uh, to different individuals and organizations, funding bodies uh, to really undertake that research and those initiatives tied to that uh, to, to address those evidentiary gaps. And then finally, uh, and importantly, uh, is to cultivate that student and practitioner interest in actually doing the research as well. So as we lead into today, a uh, quick overview of what those research, the research agenda is, and it's really made up of uh, four main pillars. Uh, the first one is really focused on real world evidence and really how does that inform uh, managed care pharmacy decision making. Uh, the second pillar is around value-based models uh, within managed care and how does that address the overall total cost of care. The third pillar, uh, really looking at the benefit design or utilization management impact and the strategies around those in terms of how they address patient outcomes. And then finally, what is the impact of direct patient care services uh, that are provided within the managed care pharmacy community and their overall impact on patient outcomes? If you'd like to learn more, there's a citation here at the bottom of the screen uh, that can help provide more information. So with that, uh, I am extremely happy uh, to introduce I Quinn Nguyen. Uh, to present her best poster, poster virtual presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Ai Quinn Nguyen, and I'm a current PGY1 managed care resident from Prime Therapeutics slash Magellan Rx Management. Today, I will be going over my poster, which is Retrospective Claims Analysis of Opioid Prescribing Patterns, specifically single and combination agent use for acute pain and subsequent conversion to chronic opioid usage among commercial members. My poster evaluated opioid prescribing patterns and outcomes through a retrospective analysis of paid pharmacy claims within a commercial health plan. Specifically, I was assessing the impact of the initiation for combination agents like oxycodone acetaminophen or single agents like oxycodone to see if they had a predictive role in opioid naive members who subsequently convert to opioid dependence. For some quick background, pain is a complex phenomenon that must be managed through a highly individualized approach. For opioid naive patients, physical dependence can occur in as little as four to eight weeks. Therefore, the most impactful intervention will likely be those that target opioid naive members to prevent chronic misuse. According to the 2022 CDC opioid prescribing guidelines, non-opioid therapies are found to be at least as effective as opioids in many types of acute pain and should be maximized. The combination of a non-opioid with an opioid can produce additive analgesia by activating multiple pain inhibitory pathways to provide relief for a broader spectrum of pain and reduce adverse effects. Thus, the purpose of my research is really to see if starting with a combination agent or single agent in opioid naive members with acute pain plays a 
role in conversion to chronic use, which can be potentially used as a beneficial guidepost for pharmacists to target interventions and outreach in opioid-related clinical programs. Moving on to the methods, an observational retrospective analysis of paid pharmacy claims in a commercial health plan was conducted over 15 months using SAS and SQL. My specific sample population I wanted to capture were continuously enrolled members age 18 to 64 with commercial insurance who were opioid naive and prescribed either a combination or single agent. To do this, I used a baseline period of nine months with a three month look back period to confirm the member had no opioid prescribed to confirm that they're opioid naive. Then in the six month period, I included members who had an acute fill defined as less than or equal to seven days who were prescribed either these combination or single agents. Since there are many opioids available, I only included those with a non opioid combination available to keep the groups as comparable as possible. Baseline characteristics like age, gender, chronic disease score, day supply, and MME on the first claim were also assessed between my two cohorts. My primary outcome evaluated the proportion of members who converted to chronic use defined as greater than or equal to three months of continuous opioids during the six month evaluation period which was modeled after the CMS opioid utilization reporting metrics. Finally, some additional secondary outcomes like average MME, proportion of members engaging in pharmacy or prescriber shopping, members prescribed a concurrent benzodiazepine or skeletal muscle relaxant were also assessed as these have been found to be possible risk factors that also contribute to chronic usage. In my study, 18,660 members met the inclusion criteria with 13,561 and 5,099 members in the combination and single agent groups respectively. At baseline, my cohorts are pretty similar in age, gender, and level of comorbidity. The day supply and average MME on the index claim were also relatively low with a day supply around three to four days and MME around 30 a day, which is consistent with CDC recommendations for acute pain prescribing. My results surprised me as out of the entire 18,660 member population that fit my inclusion criteria, only 33 members actually converted to continuous opioid users. Of the 30, 33 total members who converted to continuous opioid users, 22 members were in the combination group and 11 were in the single agent group. Since the results population was so low, no statistical significance was found using linear and logistic regression models with an alpha value of 0.05 for either of the primary or secondary outcomes. To make sense of my results, I performed some additional literature research and found that following the passage of the 2016 CDC opioid guidelines and large increase in opioid-related overdose deaths, the number of states with laws that impose enforceable limitations on opioid prescriptions for pain treatment have increased rapidly from 10 states in 2016 to 39 by the end of 2019. Across all 50 states, there are varied laws on acute pain, MME dosage limits, and first-time prescription fills, with 46% of states requiring day supply limits of seven days. While my results did not find that combination with a non-opioid played a significant role in predicting chronic opioid usage, less than 1% of members from both cohorts converted to chronic use possibly indicating a day supply of less than seven days and average 30 MME a day may be more important than maximizing non-opioid therapies to prevent conversion to continuous use. However, there may be additive analgesic benefits with combinations due to their multiple mechanisms of action. Ultimately though, the opioid legislations and CDC guidelines likely played a tremendous role in the low number of continuous users as it helped regulate prescriptions for opioid naive members as seen from the low day supply and MME on the index claim in my cohorts. And the slide quickly wraps up all of the references that I used during my poster presentation. And I just want to thank all of the members who helped contribute to this research. Specifically, I want to thank Kristen Baum 
Gentry, who is the Director of Clinical Outcomes and Analytics Research over at Prime Therapeutics, as she played an instrumental role in just being a fantastic leader in terms of guidance and support. I also want to thank my um, other members of the clinical outcomes and analytics team that also assisted me, like Brooke, Katie, and Jared. Finally, I also want to thank my residency program director, John Magnus, um, for all of his instrumental support throughout this whole process. In addition, I would like to thank the vice president of the clinical outcomes and analytics research department over at Prime Therapeutics, Karim Prasla. Well, thanks, I, Quinn Wynn. That was really good information, especially in a category, in a disease category, or a medication category, if you will, in class that has had a lot of attention over the years. And I think some of what you found is probably an outcome of all the time, effort, and research that has gone into this even before you. So um, interesting results. And so thanks for sharing. So as we kind of think back to you know what we were talking about as we were starting um, our presentation today, you know, one of the things with uh, the JRC is our four pillars. And so we have them uh, listed here in front of you and um, we may be giving it away on this slide, but if you can kind of walk through which pillar your uh, research best fits with and a little description why. Yeah, so out of the four pillars, this research likely falls into the first pillar, which is real world evidence to inform managed care pharmacy decision making. My research evaluated retrospective paid pharmacy claims to see what the real world opioid utilization and prescribing patterns looked like to see if there could be beneficial guideposts for pharmacists to target interventions and outreach in opioid related clinical programs. My results found a very low number of members who converted to subsequent chronic usage, which I concluded likely was the result of the opioid legislations and CDC guidelines playing a tremendous role as it helped regulate prescriptions for opioid naive patients. Thank you for kind of going over that for the uh, for the listeners and everything. So thank you. So I think maybe we can kind of take a step back and just uh, if you don't mind a couple questions we have for you just kind of around your research and um, how you got into it and those type of things. But, you know, one of the things that I think some people are always interested in is uh, out of all the research that is done, obviously there's a reason why, right? There's a reason why individuals are looking at certain categories and types of research and areas. So for you specifically, you know, why did you focus on this particular research and this particular topic? That's a great question. As we were kind of alluding to earlier, this topic has played such a big role in America, and I feel like most people are able to relate, know of, or have loved ones who have been impacted by the opioid crisis. I pursued this topic as I was extremely curious and felt like others would be too about the real world utilization of opioid rates and to see if things are actually improving following the current legislations and guidelines. So I'm um Sure, you had some learnings through this. Um, I know uh, the folks that I talk to, no research project or anything goes the same uh, each time you do one. So, um, you know, specifically for you, what did you learn through the process of this particular uh, research you did? Um, it, kind of what you, you know, what'd you learn through it? Yeah. So one of the coolest aspects about my residency program with Prime Therapeutics slash Magellan Rx Management is that they also teach you how to code through the programming languages SAS and SQL. And so I was given essentially full creative direction to choose any managed care topic that I wanted. So this is really the first time I've actually ever been able to pull and analyze my own data, design my methodology, and then clinically deduce what my findings mean. Sometimes a different language, too, uh, just trying to do the coding and everything. So um, that's great experience um, and definitely come in handy later, depending on what you want to do. So, you know, outside the coding and the research and stuff that you did, you know, there's a lot of, you know, advice that we can get others. And whether it's to students just getting into pharmacy school or their particular clinical uh, education, those that are just graduating or those that have been out in the uh, you know, working in the field, if you will, uh, for, you know, longer periods of time, but want to get into research, you know, regardless of that particular individual, you know, what advice would you give others that are looking to get into research? 
Yeah. So this research really is the culmination of about nine months of hard work. So I think being involved in every direction of my project allowed me to be very passionate and articulate on how and why I was able to do things, which really contributed, I believe, to my success in the research project. Therefore, my biggest takeaway really is to choose something that you're passionate in for your research, and it'll definitely show. Great. Well, I, Quinn Wynn, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure to speak with you, uh, get to know your research uh, more, and uh, give you another opportunity to, uh, to talk about your research in another forum. So again, thank you for uh, spending the time with us today um, and our viewers uh, that'll be watching this. So as we wrap up, I want to thank everyone for listening. And if you want more information on uh, AMCP Foundation Best Poster Competition, uh, more information on the Joint Research Committee or other poster presentation resources, uh, you can visit the AMCP Foundation website and some of the information is actually listed uh, on the information in front of you today. Finally, I do uh, want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware there is a new AMCP Collaborate community and it is now live. Uh, so the Managed Care Research Community is designed to facilitate uh, the exchange of ideas and information and really encourage in-depth discussions related to managed care research. So join today and engage in the innovative and thought-provoking research discussions. A uh, little bit of where that is can be found on the screen in front of you here. With that, I do, uh, that concludes our uh, session today. I do again wanna thank our poster competition uh, funding partner, CVS Health for their support. And again, I, Quinn Wynn, thank you very much for joining us today and for everyone else, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.